Well, hello, everyone. Greetings. I'll tell you, after that opening, I almost feel like I want to find a bunker somewhere. I don't know about you, but wow. <laughs> uh, hello. It's a lot, lot to live up to there. Uh, good evening. On behalf of the National Community Rights Network and Move to Amend, welcome to this program, Striking Down Democracy, How Our Rights Are Hijacked by Corporations in Our Communities. I'm Greg Coleridge, uh, Move to Amend's Outreach Director and co-facilitating this evening with Kara Scott from uh, the National Community Rights Network, who you'll hear from momentarily. Uh, thank you so much for attending. I also want to thank and acknowledge Alfonso Soldana. He is the MTA Move to Amends Tech Guru, who will ensure that we stay connected and will help monitor and lift up uh, questions and comments. It's uh, really very encouraging that there's so much interest in this topic. Uh, based on the number of um, RSVPs. Corporate power, corporate rule, corporate control is for the most part uh, framed by those fighting it as a problem solely of corporate money in elections and corporate influence. And that's, you know, for the most part where the issue begins and ends. But the uh, corporate preemption of the local right to decide has in many instances uh, very little to do with corporate uh, First Amendment political free speech. And so Hopefully that will be lifted up by um, uh, speakers uh, this evening. A few logistics. Uh, we invite you to share comments or ask questions on Facebook uh, or on YouTube, whatever platform you may be on, uh, which we are closely monitoring. If your questions are to be specific, uh, are to specific panelists, uh, make sure to indicate that. Otherwise, we'll just assume that it is uh, a grab bag and open to anyone. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Kara. Uh, Thank you, Greg. So we got our three speakers tonight. We have Chad Nicholson, Susie Bizen Bierzendorfer, and Deborah Fant. Uh, our first speaker is going to be Chad Nicholson, and he's been engaged in community rights work since 2009, initially working with Envision Spokane on a bill of rights protecting neighborhoods, workers, and the environment. He then moved on to help communities in New England, working with Maine and New Hampshire. Currently, he is the Pennsylvania organizer for CellDef, and he assists communities to engage in right-based organizing on issues ranging from environmental protections to, to prisoners' rights. Um, Chad's latest project is working directly with the state legislators to introduce a Pennsylvania state constitutional amendment to guarantee community self-government. He's also worked in Grant Township, which is what he's going to be talking about today, is the story of Grant Township. And he assisted with the drafting of a rights-based local constitution, an ecosystem, ecosystem attempt, <clears throat> excuse me, to intervene in a federal lawsuit, and a law that legalizes nonviolent direct action to protect the community's rights. So Chad has also appeared in Rolling Stone. He's uh, been in a documentary on Grant Township, The Invisible Hand, and his recent work also includes, like I said, working with the legislators to try to promote the, the uh, initiative for self-government. So that being said, Chad, I'm going to give the floor to you and look forward to hearing your great story. Okay, thanks, Kara. Um, can you hear me? All right. Uh, thanks and good evening, everybody. Um, actually came up through Grant Township this afternoon, uh, visiting with folks there. And if folks are unaware of what's been going on in Grant, I'm going to use that as a kind of a lens of how I think it ties into how rights are hijacked um, by corporations and communities. And also what happens when communities refuse to have their rights hijacked? What happens then? Um, so Grant Township is small, rural. It's about 630 people, um, mostly poor, mostly elderly, um, in West Central Pennsylvania, former coal country. And they're being threatened with a, a frack waste injection well, which would basically be like a sewer, uh, a waste dump for the fracking industry. And uh, the fracking waste can contain radioactivity, uh, it can contain toxic contaminants like toluene and benzene, all kinds of stuff that we don't even know about. And so the community there um, has been resisting it since 2013 and have found that the state and federal 
so-called environmental regulatory agencies like the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency at the federal level, um, the DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection at the state level, those agencies have permitted these harms. They've allowed them. They have said, this is a fine activity to go into your community. And the folks in Grant Township said, we don't accept that. This is clearly going to uh, harm our community, whether it's the trucks, whether it's the toxic contaminants, whether it's um, just the uncertainty associated with all this stuff. And we can't trust the oil and gas industry with its history of violations. And so, you know, the, the people in Grant that I've been working with, they're not, um, they weren't activists before. They're uh, people that have been living there. Um, it's quiet. There's not a stoplight in Grant Township, um, and they like their quality of life. And basically, they were told not just by the corporation, and the corporation early on told them, you don't have a say over whether or not this comes in. This isn't a local matter. This is a state and a federal matter. The corporation said that to the local elected officials. And then the state and the federal environmental agencies also said the same thing to the community. They said, this is really not your um, prerogative. This is ours to make that decision. So basically the community was told, you don't get a say in this. A corporation headquartered outside your community and agencies headquartered in Harrisburg and DC are gonna be the ones that decide this for you. And they were unwilling to, um, to take that. And they said, we're gonna not accept this. We're gonna pass a local law that bans the injection well as a violation of our constitutional rights in the community. And not just the rights of humans, but also the rights of nature. That this isn't just about the human right to a healthy environment. It's also about the right of ecosystems to exist and flourish independently of any benefit to humans. That the ecosystems themselves should have the ability to exist and flourish regardless of whether we as humans get a direct benefit from it. So it's a kind of a new front, um, you know, rights of nature. We may get into that later on tonight. I don't know. But in environmental work, which is not just seeing environmental protection for human benefit, but seeing it as something that's intrinsic for the health and uh, of the ecosystems themselves. Um, I know we've only got about five to seven minutes here, and so I'm going to speed this up very quickly. What happens when a community passes a law that directly defies the corporation and that directly defies the state and federal governments? You might have an idea, um, which is that they have now been sued three times, twice in federal court, by the corporation that wants to inject the waste. They have also been sued in state court in Pennsylvania by the Department of Environmental Protection. So it's always hard to put too fine of a point on this, but the Department of Environmental Protection is suing this community for trying to protect its environment. The Department of Environmental Protection is suing this community for trying to protect its environment, saying to the people of Grant Township that you don't have the authority you don't have the expertise. You don't have the know-how. This is a state issue that has been decided by other people at the state level or at the federal level. And this is beyond your third. It's beyond your pay grade. You don't have the ability to make this decision. You can't. Um, we're going to make it for you. So the state sued them basically saying that their local law was in direct defiance to state oil and gas policy. Um, the community didn't back down even at that, after the third lawsuit. And actually then countersued the Department of Environmental Protection and said, you know what? We have had no choice. There is a history of violations of the environment, of people's rights, communities' rights over the past 200 years in Pennsylvania. We don't trust you. We had to take matters into our own hands because we can't expect anybody else to protect our environment. There's just, you know, literally um, things all over the state of how industry has harmed communities over the last 150 years. So we're now going to trial. Um, it's currently scheduled for April of 2022. Um, and the main questions on trial are gonna be whether or not Grant Township has the authority at a, as a community to say no to harmful activities. And also whether the State Department of Environmental Protection has actually violated its duties to protect the communities and the ecosystems and the environment in Pennsylvania. Those are going to be, it's a pretty rare event. Um, we often don't get two trials in situations like this. Um, Grant Township continues to uh, stand up. We're going through all the pre-trial prep right now with experts and we've done a bunch of depositions. We have witnesses. We're working to build a coalition of groups from across the state to try to support them in their effort because it also is not just about Grant Township. 
but what happens in Grant Township is going to have far-reaching effects in other communities. Because if Grant Township prevails in this situation, um, it means other communities then will have increased uh, local authority and control to make decisions about their future, free from interference from state and federal agencies and free from interference by corporations. It also means that if Grant Township loses, that there's an opportunity for increased confrontation, to be honest, with the state and with the corporations. As Kara mentioned, a couple of years ago, Grant Township passed a law that legalizes nonviolent direct action to protect the rights of the community, which means that if they're sold out by the courts, if the courts don't agree to uphold and protect the rights of the community, the community is actually inviting people to come in and stand with them to physically stop the harm from coming in. Because as with any movement in this country, we often know that it comes to that at some point. Um, a lot of times there needs to be confrontation in the streets where the people say these are our rights and we're not going to allow somebody to come into our community and harm us because we know we're right, even if the courts or the state or the corporations tell us we're wrong. We know that our rights need to be protected and we'll do it physically if we have to. So a lot um, to end on a little like much bigger picture note, as Kara mentioned, we also have work happening at the state level, um, which is a constitutional amendment that would legalize the right of community self-government so that communities like Grant Township and every other community in Pennsylvania can pass these laws to protect their health, protect their health and safety without constantly being on the defensive from lawsuits by the industry or by the state. How can we just make sure that communities have the tools they need to protect what they know is right and protect what is important to them? Thank you. Chad, that's, I, I never ever get tired of the Grant Township story, just the resilience of a community to be a beacon for all of us moving forward to protect our rights. And I just think that that's amazing and appreciate everything you're doing to work with Grant Township. Thank you. So our next speaker, I am going to try not to butcher her name, is Susie Byers. Byers Dorfer. <laughs> as long as I've known Susie, I've struggled with her name. <laughs> so Susie is a teacher, a geologist, a community activist, and a tree planter who has lived in Youngstown, Ohio for 28 years. Growing up in Bakersfield, California, her family owned an oil tool service company. And after getting a BS in geology from UC Davis, Susie worked as a mud logger in the oil and gas fields of California. Over the last 30 years, Susie has taught elementary school in California, homeschooled her twin daughters, and taught geology and environmental sciences at Youngstown State University. She's been a yoga student and teacher for over two decades and continues to integrate a yogic perspective into all of her life. Susie's connected with numerous local neighborhood, environmental, and faith-based groups and an original member and co-president of Trees Please, she has planted over 300 trees around Youngstown and was a lead organizer for the Greater Green Festival from 2007 to 2012. Susie co-founded the local groups Brack Free Mahoning Valley and Youngstown Community Bill of Rights Committee. These groups qualify 10 citizen initiatives for the ballot over six years and she is currently the secretary for the Ohio Community Rights Network and the president of the National Community Rights Network. Welcome, Susie. Thank you, Kara, and uh, good evening from Youngstown, Ohio, and it's great to be with y'all. Uh, so the democracy, Youngstown democracy journey began um, in 2010, when a friend gave me a Vanity Fair article about fracking, and I read it and realized that that was not my grandfather's drilling operations or my grandmother's pickling brine. And so, you know, me and several friends started delving into that. Uh, we found, discovered that the deep drilling rights under our precious park, Mill Creek Park, had been sold to Chesapeake Oil of Oklahoma. So we began going to park meetings because, you know, that's what you do when you're a concerned citizen. And they uh, quickly labeled us as, you know, disruptive radicals and just wanted us to go away. Uh, we put in a formal uh, records request and all our concerns, you know, we found leases over years and, and anyway, that, that kind of stuff. So, um, 
in March 2011, Youngstown began having earthquakes. We had um, about six to eight felt earthquakes. And um, over the period of months, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, the ODNR, um, you know, didn't make any sort of connection. They said you can't make a connection uh, between the injection well within city limits um, and the earthquakes. Now, we then began be, uh, talking to our council people and going to council meetings. And they told us that in 2004, um, HB 278, House Bill, um, was passed and took away local control only for the oil and gas industry. So that went to the state level, to the ODNR. So the ODNR, um, as many people know in any state, um, they permit and they regulate and they enforce the regulations and they get their income or they get revenue from uh, the oil and gas industry. Uh, so you could call them a captured agency. Um, so going to city council, um, we voiced our concerns and we got the brick wall of willful ignorance and uh, heard the mantra repeated over and over again, we have no local control. Um, so after uh, serendipitously finding Seldef and Ben Price, um, we encouraged the council to pass an ordinance to ban fracking in the city of Youngstown. Well, of course the ordinance idea was dismissed and we realized that we needed to uh, create a an amendment to our charter, uh, Community Bill of Rights. So uh, the earthquake activity uh, continued throughout 2011 and they shut down the injection well on December 30th. And um, we had a 3.9 earthquake on New Year's Eve on December 31st. It was felt from Canada to Indiana and really shook up our community. Um, so we also, in the fall, uh, well, months later, um, in the fall of 2012, we found that there were fracking wells in our drinking water protection area. We have a reservoir that's the water source for over 220,000 people. And, you know, talking to agencies, they, you know, there were a couple agencies, they really didn't even know that, that they were in our protected, um, you know, watershed. So um, we knew that we couldn't do anything there because the reservoir is in two different counties and all we could do really was protest, make noise, block trucks and get arrested. And, you know, and still the drilling went on. Um, and that's when Ben reminded us that we don't just have a fracking problem, we have a democracy problem. And as everyone knows, you can, <laughs> substitute the word fracking with any with many other issues. Um, and also um, in nearby Broadview Heights, which is just outside of Cleveland, uh, Mothers Against Drilling in our neighborhoods, Mad Iron, they were they successfully campaigned and passed a bill of rights because there were people getting sick in their neighborhoods from drill wells just being put right in their backyards. Again, no local control. Um, it, you know, it passed, but it's been through the courts and eventually it was overturned, which, you know, was pretty much expected. Um, so in late 2012, again, in conference with Ben and, you know, our group, we, we had started a group, the group uh, Frack Free Mahoning Valley uh, after those uh, earthquakes, after the big earthquake. So early 2012. Um, so we... Uh, did a campaign and in May of 2013, that was the first time we were on the ballot and we got 43% and um, of the vote uh, lost. We, we've never won, <laughs> but we don't lose until we quit is, is our motto. Um, so we were on the ballot twice in 2013, twice in 2014, making adjustments here and there. Um, we got smart in 2015 and used the primary election day to get valid registered signatures. So we didn't have to, you know, do as much door to door. We could save that for campaigning. Um, so we ultimately had uh, 10 uh, C boards, a uh, community bill of rights um, on the ballot. Uh, um, but we, and we got on eight times of those 10. 
So um, with challenges, we went to the Ohio Supreme Court three times and lost once. In 2015, the Board of Elections just decided that we had been on the ballot too many times, which was four, so they didn't certify us. Actually, the city of Youngstown filed a lawsuit on our behalf before we got ours in, uh, because that's not the way it's done. Um, but then um, in uh, late 2016, at the state level, House Bill um, 463 was passed, allowing boards of elections to decide whether citizen petitions would be on the ballot or not. Now they're on the executive branch, not the judicial branch, but they became these unelected judges that decided whether bills would be on the ballot or not. So in 2017, we had two bills of rights. We had the drinking water protection, and we also had free and fair elections. We wanted to try to get corporate money out of local elections. I mean, I could list big old long list of all our opponents and um but anyway so they so the board of elections used that house bill 463 to keep us off and the ohio supreme court sided with them so we had no we weren't on the ballot in 2017. Um, in 2018 we we went for it in may and we were denied access again the boe uh, used the um, the state level bill, bill the HB 463. Um, the Supreme Court kind of took their time uh, in deciding, but they decided five to two in our favor, but it was already two weeks into early voting. So there were all kinds of messes, but not only with our campaign, but with the Board of Elections, printing new sheets, you know, it was just, it was awful. <laughs> but then we were on one more time again in uh, November of 2018. Uh, we, we've we not uh, tried since. Um, lo lo a lot of tired people for sure. Um, so throughout the campaigns, our opponents spent over half a million dollars that were trackable. Uh, you know, unions and Chamber of Commerce and both Democratic and Republican parties and on and on and on. We were labeled job killers. I'm sure many people have uh, had that label put on them. I mean, it's used around the state of Ohio and around the nation. Um, so other communities in Ohio have had uh, CBORs certified or not certified. They've won or they've lost, um, but none of them have been enforced by our government. In 2019, we filed a federal civil rights lawsuit on behalf of seven communities against the state of Ohio and against the seven uh, county boards of elections, um, you know, for keeping citizens' initiatives off the ballot unconstitutionally and also violating due process, separation of powers, and voter suppression. And I, I think it's, you know, was stopped. I know we appealed it and there may be one more appeal, but again, it's just sort of that back and forth you know, play, which, you know, they just want you to go away. So, so that's the big thing is to not go away. So we are governed by the corporate state. We have learned that the system isn't broken and needs to be fixed. The system is fixed and it needs to be dismantled in order to create something more just and democratic. And just two more things. Um, you can see uh, timelines from our communities on our uh, Ohio Community Rights Network website. Um, and also coming soon, uh, Ohio communities have written and compiled their stories into a booklet, which will be published soon, uh, called Death by Democracy, Protecting Water and Life, Frontline Stories from Ohioans Fighting Corporate and State Power. So thank you for listening. Onward. That is an amazing story of persistence. I can't wait to read that book, Susie. Thank you so much for sharing that with all of us today. And um, I'm going to move on to Deborah Fant, who's lived in Oregon for 40 years. She grew up in Minnesota and worked as a nurse doing community health worked as an adolescent health in our local schools and built our, their community hospice. She, 
learned a lot about local incidents of cancer and other chronic illnesses while being blind to the ecosystem degradations in the coastal forests. In 2016, she woke up seeing the film Behind the Emerald Curtain, which is available online, and joined the Lincoln County Community Rights Network. And they are campaigning to ban aerial spray of pesticides. So they have not stopped. They are not going away. And she is here today to tell that amazing story, which is fantastic. So I will let Deb tell the story. Thank you very much, Deb. Thanks, Kara. It's nice to sit with a group of people who feel like my peeps <laughs> um, and to, to talk about these journeys of learning that we've all been on. And I, I would say that our, our little group, we live in a very small rural county um, along the Pacific coast, and we have the benefit of living in temperate rainforest, which means it's one of the best places to grow trees in the country. And it has an important role to play in the protections of our climate and holding and capturing um, um, I can't say the word, somebody help me. <laughs> Carbon, there we go. It, had, it was in there somewhere. At any rate, um, going back in Oregon's history, back at the turn of the century in 1902, our legislature at that time was fairly progressive and they put into place the ability for citizen lawmaking. And I guess the way I see that is that it was put in place as a checks and balance for the power in the state that allowed citizens to speak up for what citizens knew was, was needing protection and making law in that way. There is a very well-defined process for doing that in Oregon. And I, I will be mentioning that we, we have a sister organization, um, Community Rights Lane County, that is in the Eugene area, which is a more urban environment, but the, their county is big enough that it, it encompasses the Cascade region of the mountains, the coast range of the mountains, and, and the city. So our, they were our big brothers and sisters <laughs> and taught us the ropes about how to become community rights activists. Um, and Seldef, our organizer, um, Kai Hushka has been a remarkable resource for us over the years. So just wanna give him a, a thank you for all he's done for us. But I also want the listening audience to hear that we were a bunch of people. There was a, a contractor, there was a retired artist. There were, I think we had four nurses at one time in our small group. Um, and a woman who is, is an Im immigrant to this country who is, is a um, bilingual person. So we were a diverse group but yet none of us had ever done campaigning. None of us knew anything about politics. Um, all we knew was that what we loved, which is our, our forests that surround our area, were being decimated both by over cutting of timber and also the watersheds being impacted by those practices of the timber industry, but also the use of of aerial spray, which means helicopter delivered um, pesticides, which is a way of talking about all biocides. It's it's the herbicides, it's the um, insecticides, it's the um, fungicides. Um, <laughs> right now, the way the practices are is that the timber industry kills what's on a, a clear cut area they kill the microbiome. They kill the little burrowing animals that help to keep the soil soft and receptive to rainfall. Um, and they use these toxic chemicals and the toxic chemicals do not stay put. They blow in the wind and it's called drift when they're being applied. And yes, they do take some means to try and prevent that, but it is, I mean, it's impossible. If you have a spray bottle outside before the wind comes up, you can see what happens to the droplets of water. They, they move with the air as the temperature rises. If you've ever walked through a store where they sell insecticides, you can smell it in the air <laughs> with all these containers closed. 
that's called volatilization. And those, those chemicals do not stay put. So what, what has begun here in, in our counties was a pushback to these, these practices of the timber industry. And I have to say that when we are talking about losing our democracy, democracy is often a, a principle that we believe and hope is there. And yet the realities don't often show that that's true. In our legislature, many of our people are bought and paid for through campaign financing um, by the industrial interests. They also passed measures that were templates coming out of ALEC. Um, it's an acronym that stands for the American Legislative um, Executive Council, who comes out of the right-wing think tank and puts into place things that protect industrial profits. <laughs> so here we have statutes in our state legislature that have been passed that prevent anybody from challenging the industry. So when we look at putting, putting toxic chemicals uphill, I'm gonna use my hand as an example if I can get it in the picture. Um, if you imagine that this is the high country where there are mountains and there are forests and you apply things here, torrential rains hit that and flow downstream. And it's, it's a simple matter of physics <laughs> that that is actually happening. And there, is, there are a number of, of research projects that, that have confirmed that those chemicals can be found in the bivalves and other aquatic um, organisms at sea level. Um, so we're not making this story up. And we have the capacity to know what our, our incidence of chronic disease is in this county. And yes, we have a lot of elderly people who live here. And yet it is higher than most parts of, the, of other places where there aren't those kinds of exposures happening. So I'm, I'm going to be talking about our, our aerial spray ban. We, we wrote it with the help of um, our organizer, Kai Hushka and our local our local government here decided that they didn't like what we were doing. Um, they heard the right to enforce um, the the direct action, even if it was nonviolent direct action, as being very threatening to our local sheriff's department. And they were convinced that we were horrors, we were vigilantes. <laughs> And I, I just, I looked at the people in our group and none of us have guns. <laughs> none of us are, are violent people. Um, we were seeking to protect health and safety. And yet that was the, that was the talk that went out into the public. Um, and so we became the vigilant aunties for a while, <laughs> just as a pushback against that. But what was happening in Lane County was that they too were be writing the bills to ban aerial spraying because their people were being overwhelmed by both sides, the Cascades and the Coast Range um, for timber industry doing their thing. What happened there and with our bill as well was that there were pre-ballot challenges that happened, which means lawsuits were filed by industry and backed by the Chamber of Commerce and by the Farm Bureau and by business in general, um, and agriculture feeling threatened that their, their freedom to practice as they would like with chemicals was being challenged. Um, so we were all challenged in court. The difference between Lincoln County and Lane County was that Lincoln's court found in favor that we had done everything right, that we had followed the rules for this, this citizen measure. In, in Lane County, they also had followed the rules, but someone came up with a couple of obtuse things about single issues in a, in a citizen initiative, and they were prevented from even putting this ballot or this on their ballot for a, a citizen vote. So that has to have been something that was incredibly frustrating for our friends and, and helpers. Um, but they were kind enough to come and help us do our campaign. 
um, helping us do the door-to-door -door speaking to people. And it was quite amazing to learn who's here in our county and how many times people said, I had no idea this was going on. Um, and the other side of that is that there were people who were saying, yes, we know this has been happening and we've been injured by it. We have been harmed by it. So sh cutting to the chase, when our, when our election happened, we won by 61 votes in our county and our measure then became law. So we had 29 months of a ban on aerial spraying for the, the timber industry. And to their credit, they did respect that law being in place for the most part. I mean, there's no way that we could see all through the county that there was you know, nothing happening. But for the most part, that was, that was our understanding. Um, at the end of that 29 months, our, our court finally um, gave her her opinion, and she found with the state laws that we were preempted, which means that we were not allowed to say what was going to happen in our communities and in our water systems, and they overturned our law. We did appeal to the appeals court, and during that hearing, <laughs> our attorney's voice was not able to be heard through the, the Zoom-like um, platform that was being used. And they very quickly did a decision that said, we find with the lower court. And that meant, well, are we going to the Supreme Court? And we decided that yes, indeed, we were going to the Supreme Court. So we have filed a petition asking that our Supreme Court hear our case. And the, the, the primary focus in this is not whether or not toxic chemicals are harmful to life forms. What we're taking to the court is the situation of preemptive laws being passed in the state legislature that overturn the rights of voters to make decisions for themselves. So that's one of the big pieces. And we are looking in the, in the current events files about all of the ways around the country that, that human rights are being violated through preemption, where a, a, um, a mayor in, in Tallahassee, I believe, was fined as a person, not as the mayor, because he was trying to pass protective gun laws for his people. Um, and, you know, mask laws <laughs> and the rights of public health agencies to make determinations that are for the good of everyone. So part of our, our focus going to the Supreme Court is asking that they rule on the preemption, the ceiling preemption. The ceiling preemption is what puts a lid on what um, setting, setting up higher standards for safety and well-being than what the state has in place. So those, those are two of the important things. And in our circuit court hearing, our judge set us up well saying that we had asked for standing for one of the, the river's ecosystems in our bill. And she said that she found that to be an issue that should go to the higher courts for determination. And she found it very interesting and hopeful. <laughs> so that was kind of an unexpected thing from the lower court. Um, and we're asking the Supreme Court to weigh in on that as well, that if if humans behaviors are affecting and, and harming the ecosystems that bring our water. And in this case, this is one river that supplies five different communities water access, plus the Coke owned GP mill <laughs> locally. Um, you know, it, it could use some protection from, from human ways. So that's where we are currently. And our, our colleagues in Lane County are still doing work for community rights. And we, we have both written um, new measures that we could, we could work with that are protective of water rights and, and both public and um, privately. So we're, we're 
we're constantly learning in this this learning curve that goes like that. And currently, it for me, it's about things about the Supreme Court that I never had any interest in knowing and no need to know before now. But hold a good thought for us because we're we're still waiting to hear whether they will hear us or not. Um, and our attorneys hit about this is it it's probably a good thing that it's taking a while because they may be more likely to listen to us if if they are actually reading and considering what's what is in our our challenge. So one of the things that we learned when we did win the the vote of the people was that that was a very powerful experience way beyond our personal experience. There were two elder gentlemen who have been doing work to to support clean water and to protect their environments for decades. And they had tears in their eyes just to know that somebody had won. And I, I look at our attempt to, to be heard in the Supreme Court in the same way, that if we get there, the ramifications of this are not just about our community and about the timber issues. It's going to be about sealing preemption and how how do we deal with that across this country? How do we put a lid on the unreasonable use of that doctrine to harm people and to protect industry? So that's that's our Oregon story for right now and hold a good thought for us. Definitely. Definitely, Deb, because I, I mean, what comes out very clear to me in all three of your stories is these are, we're all ordinary people that were having ordinary lives. And then when they decide to dump in our backyards, we realize how stacked the system is against us, you know, and it's, I know that's an emotional roller coaster when you are knee deep in that fight. But I feel like your stories uh, are a beacon of hope for all of our communities working on the ground with your hands in the dirt, hours and hours of time, time away from your families that are that you're protecting from these toxic chemicals that are being put into your wells and your water and your food and uh, just to be able to continue that fight i really am grateful to all of you for your leadership in your communities and for everybody that stands behind you to make sure that you are continuing this fight to show the to show the world that we can rise up and with that i want to lead to another organization with Greg, who's going to talk with Move to Amend, who's doing amazing things from the top down. And I think hopefully what our hope is that we meet in the middle and, and can work together and continue this work from all different aspects. I'm very proud of what Move to Amend is doing, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the stories. So, Greg? You're muted. That might help. That's so much better. <laughs> yes. Well, thanks, Karen. Thanks so much uh, to Deborah and Chad and Susie for your uh, amazing uh, uh, personal stories and uh, the work that your colleagues have done in your respective communities. Very powerful. Yeah, the work that Move to Mend is doing is sort of top down, but it's at the local level as well. And so to tell those uh, that story and just to say, you know, it's just terrific to be working with National Community Rights uh, Network and CELDEP, the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, which we think are kindred spirits in sort of addressing some of the fundamental issues behind corporate rule that goes beyond simply money and politics. And so, yeah, very much uh, looking forward to some ongoing relationship and see where it goes. So um, with that, just want to introduce both uh, Jessica Munger and Michael Tucker. I'll do it uh, together. Uh, Jessica Munger is Move to Men's program director. She hails from California, but now lives in Las Vegas. She oversees the development of numerous educational endeavors, including our movement education program. 
Most recently, she coordinated a move to men's national showing of the film, The New Corporation, the unfortunate uh, necessary sequel. She also, she also connects with uh, several uh, organizations on a variety of uh, different projects that are in various stages of development. Michael Tucker drives much of Move to Men's work in the Los Angeles area. His work includes education, advocacy, and organizing on behalf of ending the twin bazaar. Constitutional doctrines of money is free speech and corporations are persons, which is addressed by our We the People Amendment, HDR 48, in the uh, current House of Representatives. He's been active uh, uh, in reaching out to other groups and in lobbying congressional representatives, uh, currently, in fact, uh, very recently, in bringing on board uh, co-sponsors to HDR 48, which numbers right now, as of today, I believe, 81 co-sponsors. So um, Jessica, and then followed by Michael. Greetings. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. Um, so as you've probably gathered by now, the picture here is that there's a long history of corporate power and preemption being used to further consolidate power and wealth and maximize profit at the expense of communities. Um, billionaires and the ultra rich and their multinational corporations today are continuing a long arc of colonization and violent extraction that has actually been in motion for centuries, right? Um, through time, as the ruling class has made more rules in favor of their own accumulation of wealth and power, um, technology has changed and culture has changed and industrialization and capitalism changed communities and the way that we engage with each other and corporations and government grew together as one and figured out how to profit from nearly every single aspect of our lives. Um, and throughout this history, people like the people here tonight telling these really inspiring stories have been resisting and struggling and tearing down these barriers and building up each other. Um, because it's clear, I think, that our communities are the places where we build power and corporations and the governments who work for them are ensuring preemptive ways to erode our tools of self-governance and prohibit democracy from happening. They've tried and succeeded in making democratic practice literally illegal, right? Um, because what really is democracy, but the practice of being meaningfully involved in the way that our communities are set up and the way that our society runs. So as we hear about the sharp tools and the big money behind these efforts to prevent us from making our communities safe and strong, it's easy to get tricked into nihilism. It's really hard um, and it can feel insurmountable. And we've heard these stories of how many times you have to try. Um, and it's easy to get tricked into thinking that these are natural forces at play or that humans are bad and violent and that capitalism is a natural extension of human behavior but that's propaganda and it's really intentional and it's nonsense. And I take comfort in knowing that although corporate power and capitalism are such large and insidious problems, um, that they have been intentionally constructed. And I feel empowered when I remember that these things were put together and they can be torn apart, right? Um, but I think to know how to dismantle the tools, we have to understand a bit about how they work. So um, one tool, that's being heavily employed in the United States, and a lot of the stories we're hearing, is corporate constitutional rights. Um, so as many of you likely know, corporate constitutional rights is the extension of American constitutional rights to corporations through Supreme Court decisions. So that's a small group of unelected, unaccountable, wealthy people in robes deciding that a company is a person, that the corporate person's ultimate duty is to maximize profit, and that the courts commit to protect the corporate person above real people and communities every time. Um, so using these like sacred victories that have been hard won by people's movements, like the 14th Amendment, corporations have co-opted what it means to be recognized as a human being in this country and used it against us. Um, so corporations enjoy many constitutional rights, including the first, fourth, fifth, and a few notable clauses, um, but I'm going to use the example of the 14th Amendment to illustrate my point because I feel like it's one of the most horrific examples. And it's also the first time that corporations were extended um, the same rights as human beings. So as a brief reminder, um, the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendments were added in the Reconstruction era to create civil rights 
for previously enslaved human beings. These are some of the most important amendments um, and are seen as sort of sacred in the story of fighting to be seen as human in this country. Um, the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protections Clause, says that the state may not deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. The idea that a corporation is considered a person with equal protections of the law was first used in 1886, which opened up this new kind of constitutional strategy to bolster the power of large corporations, which at the time were mostly railroad companies. Um, so since then, the 14th Amendment is used by corporations to preempt communities from defining their local economies, from stewarding the land they live on, keeping poisons out of their water, and a, a million more examples. Um, and in fact, the 14th Amendment was decided to apply to corporations in 1886. And since then, a large majority of the cases brought before the Supreme Court involving the 14th Amendment have been about corporations and profit and not about equal protections for actual human beings or to codify the rights of previously enslaved people or any way that it was intended. Um, so one example is when Florida residents voted uh, to levy higher taxes on chain stores than locally owned stores. This was a democratically passed attempt to shape their local economy but was overturned citing the 14th Amendment Equal Protections Clause. Um, the Supreme Court said basically that, you know, any city or state cannot say, Greg must pay more taxes than Jessica, and neither can they say Walmart must pay more taxes than the family grocer. So corporations have wielded the 14th Amendment um, as a shield to evade democratic control so often since this legal fiction was created. Corporations have successfully sued or threatened lawsuits, as we've heard a lot tonight, as a deterrent against communities um, favoring local businesses over chain stores, opposing the siting of cell phone towers um, and corporate actions like this and that have been described earlier tonight on the basis of discrimination or due process rights violations under the 14th Amendment. Um, but in practice, this really amounts to discrimination in favor of corporate rights over human and community rights, because you and I don't have the same resources that Walmart does to take it to court and fight for those rights. Um, so this is just a really small part of one example of how corporations use constitutional rights to preempt community control and poison us and the environments we live in, and then charge us for it, right? Um, but as I said, this is a tool and tools that are built can be deconstructed. Um, so if you haven't already, please do check out movetoamend.org to learn more about the long-term campaign to amend the U.S. Constitution to abolish corporate constitutional rights and money as a form of protected free speech. Um, there are groups across the U.S. working in their communities to do public education and lobbying and coalition building, um, and they're passing initiatives and resolutions declaring that their communities do not support uh, or recognize corporate constitutional rights. Um, so there are so many ways that we have to approach this giant problem, and we need a variety of strategies and tactics and local and national and bioregional sort of points of pressure to do so. Um, so I just want to thank you so much to all of you who have told stories tonight about dismantling and rebuilding and um, the really, really inspiring stuff in your communities. Um, so I hope that fills in some of the gaps about how these things came to be and uh, appreciate you all so much. Michael. <laughs> all right, let me unmute myself. So go ahead and start. So I also want to give just a little bit of an overview, generally what we've all been talking about. And, what, and that is the nature of the struggle that we're kind of all in right now. And that's a struggle about who's in control of our society. Is it we, the people of any, any given community, be that a, a locality, a state, or even a whole country, or a minority of wealthy interests within that community, primarily in the form of for-profit corporations? Now, the reason why this has become such a big issue is because the corporations have become the engines of our economy. They're seeing that this, didn't all, this wasn't always the case but it has become so. And so they generate a lot of profit and with that comes uh, wealth that they can then use in various ways. But what we're talking about here is not anti-corporate, but rather putting corporations back into that proper space where they act as the engines of our economy, but do not govern us. That we are governed ourselves when each of us has a small piece of that sovereignty. And we all share, like we're all kings and queens. We share that sovereignty rather being a Jeff Bezos 
or Elon Musk or some other current CEO of some corporation wielding outsized amount of power, both as a CEO and as being a very wealthy person. Now, this was, as I said, this wasn't always the case. This country started out as one very leery of corporate power, understanding that corporations, we could, we could theoretically wield or gain a whole bunch of wealth, and by doing so, create a lot of power. They understood that wealth can often bring power with it, as it has through most of human history. Um, but over time, during the 19th century, or what you call it in the 1800s sometimes, as industrialization, industrial revolution occurred, the rise of these large railroad companies, that power started developing both politically and in the courts. And as Jessica explained, the uh, in, 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 uh, these in entering into that, um, in getting their foot, the kind of foothold into the constitution, added that to the list of tools that corporate lawyers everywhere could then use to try to sue um, for to, to increase the amount of profit and externalize the cost of business. And so what we saw happen actually even before that 14th Amendment decision in the 1880s was them trying to sue that way. They were, this was part, been part of their tool, part of their, their toolbox for at least a decade, uh, pretty soon after the amendment was passed. And once that happened, then it went on to the first, the fourth, the fifth, and other uses of the 14th. And so that's the thing about lawyers in general is that they tend to want to try everything they can. And if they have the money behind them to build their hours, then they can go ahead and just try every single thing. And you'll read, if you read court decisions, a lot of time the judge will come in and say, okay, uh, that I didn't buy that, I didn't buy that. But, oh, I like this one. So it's almost like you feel like a little a la carte menu of different options of, hey, if you want to decide on, come on my side, I'll give you a whole bunch of different ways. And eventually they find judges that give, create these precedents that they can then go back to you know, once it's done. Having said that, we're now in the time of kind of corporate power. And what's happened is corporate power is generally wielded in two fundamental ways. One, it's done through various forms of lobbying. That can be direct contributions to candidates or to organizations that can then give money to candidates through you know, dark money or even in the light. I mean, people just kind of accept it now anyway. So it doesn't really matter if them, people know that a person's taking money. It's just accepted at this point. Um, through super PACs, independent organizations that corporations give to to lobby on their behalf. Uh, or, and this is the, one of the more insidious ones and harder to really deal with, is the idea of whisper job opportunities that, oh, right now you're in Congress, but you know, when you're done with this, you can come talk to us and maybe we can find a place for you. Someone even as progressive as say Howard Dean now finds himself in a lobbying company working on behalf of people like Facebook. Uh, and so that's, that's a huge option for many elected representatives and something that's very hard to legislate against. Uh, but the other side, and the side that we're more talking about here, is the use of the courts by corporations. And it starts with their army of lawyers, as we've talked about, and suing in various ways, and how the courts are packed with corporate attorneys suing to try to prevent laws that affect their profits, because they're profit engines. And it's kind of, that's their modus operandi, that's, that's the goal that they have, is to sue to increase their profits. And so, so that's something that we're not going to be able to prevent. The problem is, the other side of it, which is the judges that are supposed to apply to see over these cases, and then the laws that are governing these cases that are written by, you know, lobby politicians. And so you're kind of hurt from all sides in terms of the courts. You're kind of working at a disadvantage there. And as a bonus, the other way is the manufactured consent that we live in under and being a, being a corporatist society framework. So when we talk about when you watch the news, things are often framed as being in from a uh, from a corporate standpoint. And things are often framed in a way that benefits getting people to think that in a way that makes corp what corporations do more acceptable and makes their changing of our world in favor of externalizing costs and internalizing profits understandable and even reasonable so that we won't even fight. It'll manufacture our consent to allow them to work the way that they do. Uh, now, two things, two general notes I wanted to say about preemption. Uh, one is that we generally face an uphill battle when dealing with what I call activist judges. We've got four or five, maybe even six of them in the Supreme Court and many more um, at the federal court level and then even in states. Uh, and the problem is that even judge that once they set precedent, undoing it's very difficult. So we have an advocate, ad, what do you call it, an activist judge, what they're looking for is any way to get to the conclusion that they want. And the actual objective meaning of law in so much as that exists they're not really looking for it, they're looking for an explanation to get to where they want to be. The problem is the other side, the way judges are supposed to work 
It's just supposed to respect existing precedent and it's supposed to follow the law objectively. They're not supposed to say have a countermanding view that has an objective that may be quote unquote progressive that they then find whatever explanation they want to and lead towards that. So it's almost like you're working, you're trying to push a rock uphill because every time the, the, the activist judges and corporate attorneys win, they set a precedent that then judges that are objective and reasonable and rational then feel obliged to go along with unless they have an overwhelming feeling of need that this violates some fundamental precept of the Constitution. And that's why move to amend is trying to amend the Constitution rather than say pack courts, because it won't really work that way. Because the judges that we want to be judges, we simply want to follow the law that we the people write and we the people put into law. We don't want them to have their own agenda the way so many judges do now. And the other thing about preemption generally is that it only takes one bad ruling to chill any other legislatures from wanting to try the same thing. So as I'm going to discuss in a minute, we have this issue of, you know, the uh, corporate, uh, corporate, you know, legalized corporate corruption and, uh, and money being speech and corporations having those speech rights. Well, once you strike down a ruling that go, runs afoul of that, other legislatures who often don't have as much money as corporations to fight back are inclined not to try to pass laws that are even similar to the ones that have already been struck down. So it's hard to find a ton of examples. The only but the thing is you do find a few. And when they're struck down, you know that could have been our community too. But now we can't even try it because it's already the Supreme Court's already spoken on it. So quickly, because I think I've used most of my time, I want to just quickly talk about the, the idea of corporations using their speech to, uh, how I put this, the, the people trying to go around the issues of, you know, so, I, so we said that corporations, that, that the Supreme Court has said that corporations have the right to have the, the money, there's money speech and the corporations have that right. So what some states have tried to do is go around that by empowering people to not take money from corporations or not take money from even extremely wealthy people to abide within certain frameworks I'm speaking specifically of Montana and Arizona as two states that tried to do this. And that is say, if you'll work within our framework of regulated campaign finance, which you don't have to because of the Supreme Court, but if you're willing to do that, we will give you money to either match the independent money that's coming in from your opponent, or at the very least, give you a lot of money so that you can at least compete. And the Supreme Court in both of those cases have struck those down saying that the that money is not just speech, but it's protected in such a way that if the state tries to match it for those that don't have that money, that those people, that the state is acting in acting unconstitutionally and that we can't even match money for money from a state basis. We can might be able to do the, uh, democracy bucks or something, but that doesn't necessarily scale to the level of what corporations can bring to the table. When we try to actually just scale it, it legislatively, statutorily, it gets struck down by the Supreme Court. And now, it, it, it leaves you with not very many options to face the mountains of money that are being you know, pushed into our uh, you know, electoral process. And so that's why we have HGR 48. That's why we think we need to fundamentally change the ground rules on which the Supreme Court, legislate, the Supreme Court rules in order to right a ship that's been turned for over a century in a certain direction of giving corporations more power than people. Great. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Michael. Thanks to all of the um, um, speakers. Uh, terrific job. Uh, why don't we get right into the questions and comments. If you uh, do have a question or comment on whatever platform you are, feel free to uh, jot them down. We will try in the next uh, 30 minutes or so to uh, have them addressed. The first question from Michelle Holman. What next collaborative collaboration actions is on the horizon for CELDEF? and her state and local chapters Sell and move to amend. Uh, how will we capitalize on our, on our common themes to work toward common goals slash results? Who wants to take, take that? Sort of well, two-parter. Collaboration. I'll take that part. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm excited to let you know that Move to Amend and CELDEF along with several other organizations are currently planning a virtual symposium is coming up this spring um, and the let's see the title if we can pull this up it is uh, the system won't save us mobilizing alternative strategies so it's going to be a whole lot of trainings and really practical new system stuff 
um, we'll have a website up soon. Uh, it's going to be great. So, and that will transition into an ongoing um, coalition. Ideally, we're trying not to have it just be one weekend, but to be an ongoing uh, practice of making real some of the stuff that comes out of that event. So, um, that's the there. last weekend of April. Thank you. As far as the second part of that, uh, sort of an intriguing proposition of, as I'm reading this, interpreting it, is any thought being given to sort of figuring out how state and local chapters might collaborate or work together more. I think there has been in recent times uh, some more of that than there used to be. And I think where that has happened, um, it's been pretty valuable. And I think there's a lot more potential, uh, certainly in Ohio, uh, we tried to do a little bit of uh, work and support. Move to Men did issue an amicus brief in support of the 2018 federal uh, uh, challenge um, uh, around trying to get you know local ballot initiatives uh, to right to decide at the local level to be uh, legitimate, and you know that's been struck down, and I think is still being considered on appeal. Terry Lodge is working on that, I think, and some others. Um, and I know in other places, uh, the local community uh, rights networks and Move to Mend have had some uh, ongoing relationship, but there certainly could be a lot more. So thanks for that prompt, that suggestion. It's something we need uh, to, to do more of. And in terms of doing these kinds of things, yeah, we should do more of. What do you think, Kara? I, I was just going to say, I just think that that was our whole conversation, Greg, that you and I had, that we bring the people together, that we are stronger as we align our missions instead of fighting in our separate silos, that we are able to co-align and coexist and support each other and help each other out. I think as we begin to do that, we all grow stronger we grow larger and we can really work together to fight back. It always thinks of that cartoon where they have everybody standing on the diving board, <laughs> you know, that, that infamous cartoon, but we need to be that and we need to start working together to, to create that proverbial army that we can fight back. Right. All right. Next question from Barbara Smith. Hey, Barb. Uh, how do you raise money to cover legal costs to continue fighting corporate pushback on local efforts to assert community rights? Um, I guess I, it's not easy. Um, so, and uh, I'll piggyback on the previous question as well. In addition yeah, to what Jessica said around the symposium, which I think is going to be a great opportunity for collaboration. Um, I think some of these flashpoint uh, local community fights, like in Grant Township, there is a real opportunity for there to be much larger collaboration because this isn't just about an injection well, it's not just about one community. And there's going to be a lot of um, outreach done over the next couple of months to try to bring folks together to understand this is about larger constitutional issues and that affect us all. And that when one community is willing to put itself in the in the crosshairs, um, that there needs to be a, you know, wide uh, outpouring of support for those folks because it's not just about them. So I just want to, to mention that. And I think there is a lot of opportunity for collaboration moving ahead. In terms of raising money, um, it's hard. Um, you know, at least at the Legal Defense Fund here, we're generally about um, half individual donations and half um, uh, foundation um, and grants and things like that. You know, we have a fundraising team that's working on that. But um, as I would imagine many folks on this call are aware, um, a lot of foundations are funded by corporate money. Um, and so uh, having that be the sole source of funding is not a, um, a long-term strategy, um, at least in my opinion. Um, it can be helpful, but you know, if we piss off the wrong uh, foundation or you know, somebody on a, a board of a foundation has an interest in something, um, you know, that funding stream can be cut off overnight. And so uh, I think there's a, you know, a question of how do you build that um, that structure up over time and not have it be necessarily tied only to funding. And I think the attorneys we work with, a lot of them identify as movement attorneys. 
Um, and, you know, there's a question of what is the role of lawyers or attorneys in this work? Is it them being out front, you know, essentially riding in on the white horse in order to be the lawyer that goes into court to argue for the best interest of the community with the hopes that you win? Or is it the attorneys that are there to stand with the community, help expose the legal system, take the wins that we can get, but also understand that maybe we don't get the wins in the short term. And it's hard to find, uh, to be honest, um, you know, we work with some really incredible, amazing, dedicated attorneys, but it's hard to find folks. And, and there's often a conflict, I think, um, for attorneys who are, you know, often seen as trying to uphold the system, while the system in most of the communities we work with is working to oppress communities. So how do you uphold the system while working for change? And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we're trying to hold um, together, um, you know, in building a movement ecosystem. And I guess, you know, a couple other very quick things in Grant Township, you know, uh, there we have a dedicated team of attorneys working on this and with other communities that we're, we're involved with as well. But, you know, the other side's lining up 15 attorneys from the DEP, from the, uh, the corporation, from potential interveners. I mean, they're going to need a separate room just to hold all the attorneys that are coming up. And so, um, yeah, and so it's it's really incredible work that I think the folks, the movement attorneys are doing on behalf of communities. And at the same time, I don't know that we'll ever get the resources we need to, like, have an attorney off, you know, a battle. Of, it's always going to be a difference of resources and things like that. So we do the best we can. Um, and try to expose the system and continue to further inspire other communities to take this up. But I think, you know, again, going back to Grant, there has to be an understanding that there may not always be the attorneys that we need to, um, you know, represent the folks that most need it. Um, and we need to also be able to and willing to inspire folks to um, take on the legal work, maybe independent of uh, lawyers as well that lawyers are essentially not gonna lead the revolution. They're there to help with it, but they may not be the ones that are gonna actually solve it or get us to where we need to go at the end. And so how do we get communities to take that stuff up on their own? Others who wanna weigh in on that? I, I would comment that in our, in our small network of people, um, when we were campaigning, clearly we needed funds from our, our locality to help us do what we did. And some some of what we we had we had some good solid people who were willing to put in time to do um, you know the physical on the ground kinds of things. We had some people who had money that they could donate. Um, we've gotten people who have done monthly donations to us, which has been a really wonderful thing. Um, but but it also comes down to doing events and doing fundraisers <laughs> and um, Chuffed was one of the the online platforms that we we were going to use for fundraising um, and in in our campaign our group you know you're obligated to tell the Secretary of State's office what you have raised in funds and we were somewhere around twenty thousand dollars. And compare that with at least three hundred thousand dollars that was poured in by industry, and and one of the lessons to this is that it is not all about money; it's about what's right. And people hearing that and responding to that and resonating there, and you know, working together. And I think that's a hopeful thing. I, two things I wanted to say, Greg, real quick, is that um, I think what Deb just said, you know, pretty much one of them, reaching out within the community, you know, if we're going to be the people for the people, by the people, we need to be able to work within that community, um, look for, as the churches say, the time, talent, and the treasure, you know, it's you find the talent, you find the people that are good, that have the connections within the community and and the networking and to move beyond that, to, to be able to figure out 
who it is that you can talk to and spread that word. Social media is amazing for that. If you have people that are skilled with social media, as far as getting, getting the people riled up about what's going on in your town. And then, you know, then the money comes. But what, again, to what Deb is saying, your $20,000 is nothing compared to the corporate funding. So being able to uh, rise through that, uh, Ohio with their Lake Erie Bill of Rights, their marketing was impressive. They really were able to get a story out in a very strong way and create a, create a bed where it really growed, the, the movement grew. So, you know, I think keeping in mind that from all of these stories that occurred over years of time, that these are baby steps. Every little step you take is a baby step. And there is no necessary, necessarily, there's no end line to it. So just, you know, not looking for a dollar amount, but just looking for the next step and just keeping positive about it and energized about what you're fighting against, focused on the goal instead of, you know, the dollars, I think really helps to keep the energy into the organization, which again, to what Deb is saying is probably so much more important than the actual funding itself. Not that funding isn't needed, but. Right, right. Kind of focus on organizing people as opposed to organize money, which. Right. Yeah. All right, next question. Um, beyond constitutional amendment, what are the soft targets within these corporate entities that violate our rights? Okay, so one thing I wanted to, to say on that is that I don't know that there's any particularly soft uh, corporate target. Someone else wants to speak on that, they can, but the softest target in general for fighting this, aside from amending the Constitution, is all manner of pro-democracy reforms, you know, making sure, getting everybody involved in the levers of democracy, because although there is a degree of corporate control that exists for various reasons, um, part of the puzzle is not of having people be as involved in their state and local governments as they could be, as well as federal elections, but in particular, state and local, where you can maybe get a third of the people in the community to come out and vote. Because most of the positions that we talk about here in general, having clean air and clean water are very popular things. So the more that you have good democratic institutions, the better you're going to be able to have those things be protected through the legislative process. Um, the Unfortunately, there are certain block blockades that we've talked about that are preempted by the courts, but there are a whole manner of things that haven't been preempted because they haven't been done yet in the first place. So we have to keep pushing there in order to, you know, facilitate as much as we can the a world that we can live healthily in. Others? I'll just mention a soft target within the corporate form is the corporate charter, which technically is a, a tool intended anyway to define what a company can and cannot do and was uh, intended by the state legislatures early on uh, to be that democratic controlling entity. It's still on the books in many states to where you can uh, revoke the charter of a company that violates its terms. Now that can be problematic because those terms have been written to be so general you can do just about anything. But anyway, in Ohio, and another example actually, where uh, we're working together, Move to Amend and the Ohio Community Rights Network, uh, we have uh, put together a letter that we're going to send the Ohio um, Attorney General probably in a week or two, calling for the revocation of the charter of First Energy Corporation, which is behind the largest bribery scandal in Ohio history. And who doesn't like a, a private corporate utility anyway? Just about everybody. Um, and so uh, uh, we're going to do that, milk it for all it's worth. And uh, it's an example of just trying to raise the issue of who really should be in charge of defining what a company should or should not do. Uh, and thanks to Ohio Community Rights Network for working together on this and some other groups. So that may be another quote unquote soft target, short of an amendment. Yeah, Chad. Yeah. Um, appreciate all those and maybe just to take a different tack um, as well as. I feel like a soft target is being more creative about how we resist um, that. Um, the only limit I feel like on our work is uh, our creativity, like how far we're willing to dream or think. And like 
So when you like a community like Grant Township says, we're going to pass a law that legalizes nonviolent direct action. That's not within the script that corporations are used to, to following. And so how can we change the script? How can we write our own script? How can we do things that are creative, that are outside the box? Because um, in some ways, those are the softest things because corporations and under the constitutional structure have created the system that we all generally work within and are looking for tools and ways to, to maximize it for our benefit. But if we start beginning to think outside of that and what are alternative systems? Is it the actually having a parallel governing structure within a community? Is it uh, an assembly system? Is it direct democracy? You know, things that maybe we don't technically have permission to do under the current structure, but that we just begin doing. Um, in some ways, I think those are more threatening to uh, corporate interests than the some of the solutions that I'm also working on, whether it's through grant or the constitutional amendments, because I very much believe those are important. But the more that we keep corporations off guard and wondering about what the next moves are going to be, I think those are some of the softer targets, because once you get them outside of their script, um, uh, they're not sure what to do. So um, I think that, you know, just often we think about what we can get within what are some other ways that we could do outside the system and make sure that it's our interests that we want to promote and work for rather than you know working within the script that we were given excellent all right next one do you have a podcast on these topics great way to get the word out to share well i think i'll take this opportunity to shamelessly plug our podcast it's not a a uh, project of Move to Amend, but it is a project of Democracy Unlimited. Uh, it's called Agitated. You can find it anywhere. A new episode came out today. And we talk a lot about analysis, a lot about corporate power. Um, hopefully it's also funny, but uh, we're planning to do a lot more in a series on corporate constitutional rights and getting into how each of these are used uh, in community. So agitatedpodcast.com if you want to listen that way. It's scrolling down at the bottom. Thanks for asking. Uh, yeah, that was a setup question, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, next question. Um, would localism projects like building agrohoods with cottage industry and small business be an effective way for people to be more self-sufficient and thereby reduce support of corporate power? I'll just say that all change begins at the local level. And as much of the discussion has been tonight, we really do need to envision what we want our communities to look like, uh, you know, to be just and, you know, democratic for all. So these, you know, mutual aid. And I mean, there's just so many, um, I, I can't remember who I was talking with, but there's like so many different groups that have 10 or 12 people in and we just need to, to find our, uh, you know, look at our issues, but find the common um, goal within a community. So, you know, all positive change begins at the local level. Others who want to weigh in on this. Jessica, you've been real active in mutual aid work. Want to amplify that in any way? Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think I think what we can do on a local level to divest from the corporate structure that is crushing us is a really good thing. And and I think even more important than just like a local economy is like the power that comes from knowing and working with the people around you. It is the um, that indescribable feeling that comes from building uh, with your neighbors. So that's extremely powerful. Um, and I think like thinking about um, local businesses and small businesses and stuff like that is is extremely important and um, helpful on a local level. And also we have to know that we're not going to like boycott our way out of corporate power, right? That our dollar goes so far and it is important, but we can't stop at just thinking about ourselves as consumers, right? We have to be able to break out of that. So um, I'd say yes and. And check out there may be a buy nothing group in your community to be a part of. There's that's just growing everywhere. Free cycle. Free cycle, another. Yep. Yep. Uh next, what do we have? 
Another question, how can we help the many activists who aren't familiar with these analyses? To ask, what is really going on here? Why don't we have the authority? And to learn what uh, we've heard tonight. Thoughts on that? I got strong thoughts on that because that is why we're here tonight. That's why we're all here together tonight. And I think that looking through the websites is probably the first thing to do to get the information you need. You have the links for Move to Amend, Democracy Now, our, our National Community Rights Network, and our other state community rights network and CELDEF have all been on the screen. So these are great websites to inform you on what's going on. And actually after this, if you've signed into this program, we will be sending information out and please share it. Share it with everybody that you know so that you think this is gonna resonate with because it is through the growth of one person at a time that we are going to be able to expand this movement and really have a powerful place. So thank you, Ella, for asking that question because it is not, I always say, I say this all this time, we're a very heady group of people. And when you start talking about, hey, there's this exciting program on constitution tonight, it's like, yeah, mm, Mm, gee, I was uh, really planning on doing something like scrubbing toilets. So I'd love to join you. But <laughs> so, you know, but to be able to explain what's going on and, and through these stories about how, how, you know, these ordinary people have risen up and stood up in towns of like Grand Township, but less than 700 people. I think that's the important thing to realize. I mean, it seems like our story is bigger than what the average person wants to bite off. But when you realize that's not necessarily the case, that it is the everyday person in the everyday community. And we have nurses, we have yoga instructors, we have all, all of these different backgrounds coming together and learning we didn't know anything when we started this so it's it's sharing please share ella please share i would i would make a pitch too for um cell Def's program that's called democracy school and it's now a, an online zoom gathering so people from all over can participate and it's quite ill illus, illustrative <laughs> How do I say that? It illustrates fairly clearly why the system is built as it is. Rigged. Uh, yeah, and I'll just add quickly that Move to Amend also has a free virtual self-paced program. It's called the Movement Education Program. If you go to move to amend.org slash education, you can find it there. Um, and yeah, I, I think uh, being able to point people to the actual things that are causing the problems that make them so mad in a way that's relatable and not all in our heads um, can be really useful. So hopefully we can help you do that through more media like this. And one very tangible thing that every single person here could do is when this event and this video is uh, posted on wherever, on YouTube, you can link it and send it out social media and say, hey, I listened to this, I was part of this, it was a really cool event, check it out. That's something every single person can do. Spread the word. Absolutely. All right, anything else that we should say other than just to affirm what Kara said, you will be getting uh, probably two emails, one from Move to Amend and one from National Community Rights Network saying here's a few links some of which have already been shared, but just to reinforce those, to check out informationally, action-wise, throw us a few dollars or whatever the case may be. So uh, watch for those. And thank you. Thank you all for joining us tonight. We had a really large group and I'm real excited that all of our presenters were able to be here and share their stories with you. Thank you all. Thank you to Alfonso for doing all the techie stuff in the background. We don't see him here, but he's 
done amazing work and uh i look forward to our next programming and uh seeing you all there again thank you very much Likewise, thanks all thank you. have a good evening Bye. good night Constitution, there seems to be some type of confusion. I thought it said the people were the institution and not the corporations that simply want to use them. The truth is currently a fusion of corporate loot and our government that is outright abusive. People need change, the state it refuses. They're saying we're mistaken, well, show us where the proof is. They control the media, movies, and the music, and determine where supplies of the water and food live. We need a strategy. Here is a solution. Build a movement to give our rulers improvements and infusion of human to counteract the hubris that has our ecosystem near useless and our youth pissed. The founding fathers were flawed, but they knew this, so they gave us the tools to move with. Let's use them. Move. Corporations are not people, too. Money is not speech. Uh, man. In fact, it's the root of all life. Right now, and it's time to take to these streets. Move. Corporations are not people, too. Money is not speech, uh, man. In fact, it's the root of all life right now. So get on out of your seats.